Welcome everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Samuel Aguida. I'm the IWA uh, Strategy Programs and the Engagement uh, Manager. And uh, um, so uh, this is a webinar uh, co-organized by the International Water Association and the um, Horizon 2020 project Prime Water. And the focus of this webinar is end user outlooks on earth observation. So um, these, uh, uh, some information about this uh, webinar before we start. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and made available on demand on the IWA Connect Plus platform uh, with the presentation slides and other information uh, connected to this session today. Um, the speakers are responsible for securing copyright permission for any work that they will present today, um, for which they are not the legal copyright holder. And uh, finally, uh, we would like to stress that opinions, hypothesis, conclusion, and recommendation contained in the presentations and other materials are the sole responsibilities of the speakers and do not reflect uh, the uh, necessarily reflect the IWA's opinion. So um, some housekeeping rule. Um, on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat function. This is to uh, gen for a general request and uh, interactive activities. Please feel free to introduce yourself there and let us know um, where you're from, what's, uh, what's your um, job, and uh, um, how do you use heart observation in your, um, in your everyday job. Uh, the um, chat box um, is used to send questions uh, to the panelists, and we will collect all these questions and answer them during the moderated Q&A. And uh, just a note that we cannot reply to raise and uh, so please do not use this function. Uh, during the webinar, we will use the collaborative tool uh, group map. And uh, my colleague Erin is adding this link into the chat. Please uh, log in now, uh, as this will be the key um, tool that we will use today. And uh, for you to um, uh, start working with the group, now we have created a very um, uh, short um, icebreaker activity. Uh, so you should be able to uh, log in in group map and uh, add uh, your um, your name by clicking or where you are based in the world. So I'll give you about um, two minutes to do this. And uh, please do let us know in the chat um, if you are having any problem with this. Um, the uh, group map can uh, become a bit crowded, so I'll keep moving around. If you cannot exactly click where you are from, please don't. Um, uh, it's, it's just not a problem. It's just for you to see how if you can log in and uh, um, use what, um, this this tool. Um, if you have already added your name, you can click on it, and then uh, you can share with us your company your title, and also how do you use uh, heart observation in your work. And I see some of you already started feeling, so thank you for that. So I'll give you a couple of minutes for that. Okay, I see the map uh, getting busy.
we have about 40 seconds to finish this. So over the course of the uh, webinar, we will uh, keep using uh, this uh, uh, tool. You don't actually have to re-click on the link. I'll just move you around um, in the other um, section of the, of the group map. Uh, so just keep this open in, in your computer because this is, uh, or your phone, whatever you are uh, logging in uh, from. And uh, we will keep using this uh, during the session. Okay, so while you keep um, filling your, your information, I'll go back to the uh, presentation. Um, so today we have uh, um, a very busy agenda. Um, Apostolis from MBIS will uh, um, follow my presentation with a presentation uh, to uh, set the scene. Then Evangelos uh, from MBIS will uh, talk about the Prime Water Operational Platform with uh, case studies examples. Um, the panelists will then be involved in a moderated, in a moderated discussion and Q&A uh, where we will answer to any, question, any questions that you may have. And then we will do uh, a group map activity and my colleague Jordan, um, Erin Jordan will then uh, wrap up the session. So um, today we are joined by expert um, panelists who have uh, kindly, kindly accepted our invitation to share with us their expertise and, and knowledge. Um, Roini um, Ganor Ganorkar, um, Senior Technical Assistant, uh, Forest Survey of India, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. Jordi uh, Cross Herrero, um, Head of Innovation at ADASA and President of the Catalan Water Partnership from Spain. Uh, Fabian Chang, CEO and Funding Partner and Director of Aqua Intel uh, from Ecuador. Um, Evangelos um, Spiracos, um, who is the Associate Professor of uh, Biological and Environmental Sciences at the University of Stirling in Scotland, here in UK. Um, P. Um, Somasekar Rao, uh, Director of the Advanced Center of Integrated Water Resource Management at um, WRD in India. And uh, finally, um, Apostolis Zimas, Managing Director of at MBIS Consultant Engineers in Greece, and Evangelos Romas, um, Head of the Research and Development Unit also at MBIS. So uh, without uh, further ado, I'll uh, um, uh, hand the floor to Apostolos, who will uh, um, present uh, the topic of this uh, webinar today, and they will set the scene. So I'll stop sharing, and um, Ap Apostolos, the uh, floor is yours. Hello, um, on our side. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, happy to be here and uh, sharing um, uh, our insight and our results uh, from a Prime Water uh, project uh, in this uh, webinar. I'm going to um, uh, set, as uh, Samuela said, uh, set uh, a little bit of the scene about um, mostly about the uh, the demonstration that will follow afterwards. Um, uh, Gelis Romas, and just share a few uh, words about um, what is Prime Water, what we've been, uh, uh, Prime Water is, is a research innovation uh, project. Uh, it's almost, uh, it has almost completed uh, its lifetime uh, and has generated, had produced a lot of interesting results that we will uh, hopefully like to share with you today. Uh, the focus today will be on mostly on the operational uh, services that uh, came out of um, uh, out of, of this collaborative uh, uh, effort, um, generating a platform uh, with tools for hydrological hazard exposure and vulnerability reduction um, uh, in water. So uh, the focus was mostly on inland uh, fresh water uh, systems. And um, what we've uh, been working uh, all this period is uh, was to combine satellite data, uh, mostly uh, multispectral uh, derived water quality products, uh, with of course uh, proprietary data that were available uh, on the ground uh, to generate uh, forecasts of water quality 
uh, and quantity, of course, uh, attributes. And then furthermore, to go uh, more downstream in this chain and repurpose this, uh, the, all this information into um, specific services for um, the case studies that we've been um, uh, working with. And this is what we would like to share with you today and initiate a discussion around that. So very, 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 very quickly, um, a lot of different components uh, are used in these um, operational services, uh, different types of models, different types of uh, I mean, hydrocological models, different types of earth observation data. Um, new techniques have been tested and have been have been uh, introduced operationally in this uh, uh, system in order to have at the end of the day a credible uh, multimodal chain that can generate uh, these um, uh, forecasting uh, uh, forecasted information uh, with um, aiming uh, in a prediction time of uh, short to medium forecasting uh, period of up to ten days. Uh, a lot of science uh, has been uh, has been done uh, in these uh, three and a half years, um, as mentioned before, testing a lot of uh, different approaches, uh, trying to elicit and identify suitable ones for for um, uh, case studies and the applications that we were um, looking at. So that's um, a very interesting component, but. Um, Mostly, as I said, our intention today is to share the final outcome uh, in the form of uh, the services that have been produced. So the Water Quality Intelligence Suite, uh, as we call it, um, has uh, some distinct features, and that is to connect um, uh, all the information that is um, needed with um, a very, very central role played here by the Earth Observations. Um, and provide and provide uh, strong, let's say, monitoring uh, um, tools uh, to fill in water quality information gaps uh, in time and, in time and space. And then, as I mentioned, another very clear feature um, included in this platform is the uh, uh, forecasting services, uh, hydrological forecasting services, hydrological forecasts, uh, water quality forecasts within the lake as well, uh, domain. And of course, uh, finally, uh, based on those forecasts, uh, specific services uh, targeting specific uh, requirements and needs. Uh, those services are spanning across the whole watershed. Uh, so uh, we, we proclaim here, uh, uh, the concept of uh, the watershed uh, digital twin, uh, starting with meteorology, meteorology and ending up to a specific uh, downstream service. Uh, part of these uh, services and uh, attributes will be demonstrated later on. And uh, hopefully uh, we believe and we hope that uh, we'll trigger a beautiful discussion today uh, with uh, all the panel um, uh, included. Here is a, a very quick um, glance of where we have uh, deployed uh, those services and some of those case studies uh, will be presented um, just um, immediately after by Vagelis. I hope I provided a very, very quick but comprehensive um, uh, overview of what is a uh, good appetizer for um, the next uh, 15 minutes to 20 minutes. Um, Thank you so much for that, and I hope you enjoy the uh, demonstration that will be given by Vagelis, um, and happy to have a discussion immediately after. Thank you. Thank you. So in the meantime, I want to remind all uh, participants to please uh, um, add their question in the um, chat box, in the, sorry, in the Q&A. And if you are having any problems with the group map or uh, the Zoom, please let us know in the chat. So um, Evangelos, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think you can see my screen. So uh, I will jump into the operational platform of uh, Prime Water. You can visit it on the link provided here. Uh, in Prime Water, we have uh, five case studies uh, in the uh, United States, in Australia, in, in Europe. And I will demonstrate you the operational services that we have uh, deployed, the monitoring and the forecasting modeling services that uh, are being deployed. 
I will start with the monitoring tool, uh, the EO-based monitoring tool, and I will jump into, uh, into Melbourne. So this is the Western Water Treatment Plant in uh, Melbourne. You can see uh, here on the screen a large number of uh, small ponds that uh, often uh, feature uh, algae blooming events. So with, uh, uh, with urban preservation, we're able to quantify some critical water quality parameters. Here on the map, you can see an imagery from Sentinel-2 uh, and uh, the parameter is uh, chlorophyll. So by clicking on the map, we can quantify chlorophyll concentrations in any, uh, in any pond. Uh, we're also using, uh, we're using sender LRs at the emissions uh, at an analysis of 10 by 10 or 30 by 30 meters. And uh, the platform contains uh, images for five years in the past. Uh, so you can also, we can also explore the variability of uh, its parameter in a selected point in, uh, in, the, last, uh, in the last years. Uh, other parameters that we are able to quantify are, uh, apart from chlorophyll, are turbidity in NTU, total suspended matter, absorption, uh, segregates, depth, and uh, helpful algae bloom indicator, which quantifies the presence of uh, cyanobacteria. Uh, with uh, with that observation, we are able to have um, around two images per week combined, uh, but uh, depending, this depends on uh, cloud conditions. So we can expect around 50 images uh, per year. Uh, I'm now uh, proceeding with the forecasting tools that we have developed in uh, Prime Water, and I will jump into Lake Hume in Australia to present you the hydrological uh, forecasting service. Uh, so this is Lake Hume, and uh, these are all the upstream catchments that uh, contribute uh, to this, uh, this uh, reservoir. Uh, we have set a hydrological model by, set by SMHI, which uses uh, a meteorological forecast from ECMWF to provide hydrological varieties for our case study. By clicking on, uh, on this catchment, which contributes directly to the reservoir, we can see here the discharge uh, for today and the next 10 days. So we're talking about short term 10 days forecast. Uh, apart from uh, the classical, let's say, hydrological parameters, which are the discharge and the temperature, uh, we're, also, uh, we're also able to quantify uh, nutrient loads from the catchments, like uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and suspended sediments. And uh, these are very uh, very useful uh, information for the water quality modeling that we are performing inside the reservoir. And um, on some, uh, last the comment about the hydrological model is that this is what I'm looking at right now is the deterministic forecast. We have also a probabilistic, uh, let's say, hydrological forecast. So 51 different ensemble members. And um, as you can see here, we have a uh, instead of a single value, a set of possible values. And you can see that the uncertainty is increasing as the forecasting horizon is uh, increases. The next service, uh, moving downstream to the, this, uh, let's say, uh, modeling cascade, uh, is the reservoir modeling. Yeah. I will now jump into Lake Harsa in the United States. And here, uh, using the hydrological forecast from, uh, from, IHA, from high model. We have uh, run here in Envis a uh, coupled uh, hydrodynamic and water quality model. Uh, here you can see uh, the chlorophyll A values for today and the next five days. Uh, by clicking on a point of the map, we can see how, uh, what is the value for, of chlorophyll for each point. And, how this, uh, this will evolve in the next uh, five to seven days. Um, uh, this is a coupled hydrodynamic and water quality model. The first thing is to resolve the circulation pattern. So to, to resolve how water moves inside the reservoir. And then we run the eutrophication model, which provides us chlorophyll and also nutrient uh, levels inside the reservoir. As I said, we're talking about the three-dimensional model, so we're also able to quantify uh, parameter, concentration of parameters in any depth. 
actually what you can see right here in any given point we can have a profile of uh, how this parameter uh, variates uh, with the depth and also we can have a cross sections of in the entire let's say uh, modeling domain um, these models also use are using data simulation techniques and uh, Whenever an Earth observation image or in situ image uh, in situ data sets about uh, concentration, chlorophyll concentration are available, these are assimilated into the models, so they are improving the, the, the performance of the models and their forecasting skill. Um, I will stay in the same reservoir and in the water quality model, but this time with another type of modeling, which is uh, the data driven, the machine learning uh, models. So what we are doing here is that we train for specific areas of interest in the reservoir, uh, some machine learning models uh, that are able to, again, forecast the chlorophyll values uh, for the next uh, seven days. So we're using, again, meteorological forecast, hydrological forecast, and uh, by using different types of models like uh, random forest or uh, Gaussian process regression, we are able to provide forecasts. So exactly as in the 3D models, by clicking on, on each of the select points, we can have uh, we can have the concentration of chlorophylls for today and the next 10 days. The only difference is that uh, we're talking about specific points, not the entire reservoir. And these points represent all, only the upper layer of uh, the reservoir because they have been trained with F observations. Uh, which uh, are able to quantify only the top uh, layer of the reservoir. And another nice feature of this model is that they can provide us with uh, some estimate, uh, some let's say confidence level. So you can see here the 18th and the 19th confidence level. So instead of having single value for our prediction, we're able in this way to quantify the uncertainty of, uh, of, of our forecast. Uh, now moving uh, moving down, uh, the next functionality uh, that I'm going to present in the same reservoir is the early warning functionality. So this functionality actually uh, gathers information from all the monitoring and forecasting systems and provides a, a very quick overview for the reservoir manager of what is happening in uh, its reservoir. So here we have uh, uh, three different areas. Uh, this is an area where water is abstracted from. There is also an area of interest. Uh, this is a swimming area for Lake Carsa. And this is the, uh, the, the, downstream, uh, the, down, the downstream end of the reservoir. So for each oh, one of these points, we can have um, a very quick um, overview of what's happening in the reservoir. So we can have some indicators, uh, for example, the phytoplankton production indicator, uh, which classifies this, uh, the status of the reservoir uh, depending on some thresholds. You can hear, you can see here that we are in, in a moderate, uh, let's say, status between 12 and 24 uh, milligrams of chlorophyll. And uh, also we have some other indicators useful, uh, example, for example, in the simplification image, we can see here in the graph that chlorophyll is expected to rise in the next uh, one or two days by 1%. So a, a very nice uh, tool for the, for the manager to see at a quick glance what is happening in the reservoir. And of course, you can go back to the analytical models to see more details. Um, uh, the last uh, functionality, uh, the last service I would like to present you is uh, in uh, Sardinia, in Lake uh, Mulagia. Uh, one, the special feature of this case study is that we are talking about two interconnected reservoirs. So this one on the south is uh, Mulagia Reservoir, where water is being abstracted for uh, various uses, agricultural, potable water, industrial water uses, etc. Et but there is also another uh, reservoir here on the north, which uh, uh, and the water managers are, are able to, to transfer water from this reservoir to the downstream reservoir. So this, uh, this transferring is uh, usually happening um, based on uh, 
water balance criteria, so water quality is usually kept out of liquidation. But uh, here, together with uh, ENAS, which is the water manager of uh, the Sardinia waters, we have uh, we have de deployed this water blending optimization tools. So uh, with these tools, uh, with this tool, the the water manager is able to set uh, some uh, environmental, let's say, criteria, some water quality thresholds in uh, the reservoirs about uh, chlorophyll, nutrient, uh, dissolved toxin, etc. And uh, uh, here on the left side is uh, what uh, ENAS has, uh, the points where ENAS has uh, set its environmental constraints. As you can see, we have set constraints in both reservoirs, both the upstream and the downstream reservoir. And what this tool does is that it examines uh, using the three-dimensional models deployed, it examines what happens in the base scenario. The base scenario is the scenario where no, no water is transferred from, from Mendoza. And, but also it examines a series of uh, another 10 scenarios which has increasing, let's say, uh, volumes of uh, water transfer from small ones until in the last scenario, uh, this is uh, uh, a volume close to the capacity of uh, of the, the tunnel. So uh, in this tool, uh, everything seems uh, to be okay in the base scenario. So for the next uh, five days, all constraints are met. But if I set an, uh, a constraint, a two strict constraint, like that I, I don't want the chlorophyll concentration to exceed the, the five micrograms per liter in the Mulaji abstraction. So then this tool informs us that the base scenario, so if we don't transfer any water from the absolute reservoir, we are going to fail to meet this, uh, let's say, constraint. So the user is, in the case, is um, prompt to, to make some water transfer. So this is a, a very useful tool that uh, has been set up with us and allow us to take into consideration water quality criteria in, uh, in uh, the decision making of uh, complex uh, interconnected uh, reservoirs. So that, uh, that is all for my side. Uh, I hope we are on time and we can... Thank you, Bageli. Uh, it, it was um, a journey, a quick journey around um, uh, all the um, uh, case studies that we have worked uh, within Prime Water. We've tried to be, it was a very, um, fast track, uh, let's say, journey, uh, trying to communicate um, a lot of uh, uh, information and mostly to demonstrate what might be the possibilities uh, from using advanced uh, services that are based on uh, remote sensing earth observation, but also um, uh, by using approaches and technologies that are integrating Earth observations with models and forecasting um, uh, capabilities. Um, I think uh, it was a good uh, overview. Uh, we're done here and um, the floor is yours, um, Samuel and Erin. Thank you, Apostolos and Evangelist for your presentations and the presentation and the demonstration. Um, I'm gonna ask all the panelists to uh, come on screen so that we can begin our uh, discussion. And um, I'll also remind the attendees that they can ask their questions. They can submit their questions in the Q&A section so that we could also bring them into the discussion. So um, again, thank you, Apostolus, the MVIS team, Apostolus and Evangelist for your presentations. And um, I know that we've, in a very short time, we've heard a lot. And um, we've seen that the Prime Water Operational Platform combines a lot of different things so that uh, water managers can really make informed decisions. Uh, we have, you know, different models, uh, we have um, early warning functionality, we have the blending optimization tools, uh, we have the combination of in situ with satellite data and uh, the models to make sure that the decisions can be as um, close to accurate and reliable as possible. So um, firstly, what I would like to ask is um, any of the panelists can just give your thoughts exactly how do you 
see the Prime Water platform? How receptive are you to what you've just seen in a demonstration? Anyone can begin. I will begin as an end user. Uh, it's clear that the use of a satellite with other uh, systems, it's improving the control of water quality, uh, mainly as, as we have seen the application in environmental quality. Uh, it's clear that one, probably one of the biggest revolutions has been not only satellites, uh, satellites have been using since many years, but link satellite image with artificial intelligence and local uh, measurement or local data to be able to generate this forecast that only with satellite uh, years ago was not possible. So I think that the use of prime water platform, uh, probably we will use more application for the platform uh, in the next years. Thank you, Jordi. Fabian, I see your hand is up. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think that the use of Earth observation uh, platform from Brand Water it creates value to water authorities and also water managers and and industry, specifically in agriculture activities. Uh, offering them actionable data uh, because the access for performing uh, water test analysis in remote areas becomes very difficult sometimes. So using earth observation uh, techniques can be very useful in accessing to managers um, reliable data in order to optimize decision making. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Fabian. Um, to the Envis team, I want to ask one of the questions in the Q&A chat. So from Sandra Ryan, she's asking, do water managers need to import already built models into prime water or does it already include preloaded systems or does it facilitate model building within the tool? How would this apply to locations where environmental data collection is sparse? Right. Um, right. Um, technologically wise, prime water um, couples um, a serious number of, of, of different types of, of models uh, when it comes to the operational uh, components. So um, we have relied mostly in uh, open source uh, modeling for that. So most of the models, well, not most, but all of the models that we've been using um, are um, open sourced uh, models, hydrological, for the hydrology, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, we're using um, hype model. Uh, it's um, has been uh, has been um, uh, generated, has been uh, constructed, and is supported by SMHI, the Swedish Hydrological Meteorological Institute. When it comes to uh, the water, uh, the in lake uh, water uh, water uh, modeling, uh, both hydrodynamic and ecological modeling. We're using uh, the 3D uh, suites. Of course, there are certain components uh, that are um, are used on a proprietary basis. For example, the specific uh, remote sensing uh, uh, derived uh, water quality products are produced by a specialized partner in our consortium that is EOMAP. EOMAP uh, operates its own, let's say, uh, Processing tools uh, that can that can actually translate uh, the raw data that uh, satellite picture uh, conveys to uh, uh, water quality information. So it is a uh, prime water mostly wanted to demonstrate 
the opportunities that are existing uh, using uh, uh, in, in many different, in different ways, Earth observations, uh, and mostly to, to, to against challenging, let's say, requirements for operational purposes, um, what you have seen as a suite has been constructed uh, to convey this information in the best possible way, um, together with uh, our partners, uh, our end user partners, that uh, contributed a lot to the final result that you have just seen in terms of how this information is communicated, how this information is presented. But a lot of the components uh, are based on, on free uh, and open uh, modeling uh, components. I hope this, uh, my answer uh, covers uh, uh, the initial question one way or another. We will have yes. to yeah to come back on that with more details if needed yes thank you apostolus um back to our panelists and we have a very diverse uh panel uh in the session today so i want to ask and maybe i will point this to uh vagelis spiricus um how do you see because you you are in biological and environmental sciences so how do you see uh the use of prime water in your context in research of this platform thank you uh, thank you again for the, the question just to say as well that i am at the biological and environmental sciences department but uh, my background is in physics so but I'm very much interested in the in the in the applications, indeed also the development of this uh, of these tools. And uh, uh, thank you, Apostoli and Vagel, for giving a really nice overview of the of the of uh, prime water and the work the, that you have done in this uh, in this uh, uh, project. Uh, the for uh, going back to your uh, uh, question and a little bit as a reflection as well to. Uh, the overview we've seen, uh, I think, it was great uh, to see a simulation of a combination as well of uh, uh, satellite uh, data, Earth observation data, with uh, the the modeling uh, uh, part. And this is something that um, uh, it really adds value to the to the final uh, 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 product. I was in terms of uh, research. Uh, uh, this opens many uh, many different uh, uh, opportunities uh, uh, to to exploit and explore uh, the the products uh, uh, further. Put them maybe in the climate context as well to see like uh, long uh, long term uh, changes of uh, uh, water quality and how this is associated with the hydrodynamics or other. Uh, variables that uh, are uh, are uh, tested here. So this is in terms of the of the of the research, putting them as well like this opportunity for uh, looking a little bit the bigger picture. No, look at other systems as well, neighboring systems maybe like why why one lake behaves uh, one way and uh, the other way the a, a, a lake. In the same catchment, for example, behaves in a different uh, in a different way. So this uh, really provides uh, the the tools uh, to answer some of these uh, questions. And also, I imagine like further research is needed to see how uh, these uh, uh, tools are uh, can be transferred to to other systems, to other occasions, to other types of uh, of waters. Thank you, Vagelis. Um, so, Dr. Rahini, I want to ask you because you also you you work in forestry, yeah. forest serving. So, given what you've seen today, how do you think this can be applied to forestry? Okay, thank you, Arun, for the question, and uh, thank you, Abis, for such a great presentation and uh, other products they have been providing. Uh, in the forestry sector, we basically focus on the forest environment, typically of all over India. So we do the analysis part. But uh, being a biotechnologist, I have few of the uh, base questions I can say, because uh, I totally understand that uh, 
uh, previously it is been said that uh, uh, one leg behave differently and the other leg behave differently so i think the microflora is the base uh, component which actually impacts the leg secondly uh, i totally uh, is happy the product they have been developed but i have a query that the simulation modeling they are being providing for the uh, next predictions so are they totally uh, in a positive uh, way sector or uh, they have some sort of drawback or uh, kind of thing so i have this uh, bit query because uh, uh, as earth observation has opened one of the dimension uh, in one sector but uh, parallelly we can't ignore other parameters also like uh, ground validation is one of the important parameter then environmental impact which is totally affect the environment. So these are the base questions. And uh, the question you have asked that the use of this uh, product in the forestry sector. Uh, so it will be uh, one of the helpful product I can say to get a, a, a rough idea regarding the impact of the forestry in around forest on that uh, typical environment, uh, typical lake or reservoir, which is present in that uh, forestry area. So that's it I can. I would like to complete my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Rohini. Uh, Envis, do you have a response to Rohini about her question about the, the models using being used to um, generate these index, these indices in the operational platform? Right. Well, uh, models, um, there are very, very there is a very large number of different types of models. Um, well, models are, are trying to represent, uh, to describe uh, processes in, uh, in a physical system. Uh, models try to represent um, the end result of a response and um, as, a, as a reaction, as a response to, to uh, some triggers. There are different, very, very uh, a wide range of, of, of uh, models can be used. Here in our case, um, the selection of, of the tools that we have worked with um, has been dictated by the uh, specific, uh, let's say, um, uh, challenges that uh, as a project uh, we had to address. So the focus in prime water was mostly algae bloom uh, outbreaks, phytoplankton outbreaks uh, in freshwater systems. So the selection of the tools that we have used um, uh, has, been, has been made uh, so as to, um, let's say, uh, include in this modeling and assess in this modeling uh, chain, um, those tools that actually can, can provide us some um, uh, good information about um, can describe these processes uh, and provide us with information about uh, the targeted um, parameters or indicators. So for uh, algae bloom uh, events, for example, we have worked with, with ecological models that, um, that um, uh, provide information mostly about um, Chemical, physical chemical parameters in the water, uh, targeting chlorophyll A, for example, using these parameters mostly as a proxy indicators to describe uh, or associate with possible uh, uh, phytoplankton uh, events. So we've tried to, to, to work around those concepts and elaborate those concepts a lot, concepts a lot because Although there might be tools and models that can, can be um, available around going further down um, the description of the physical systems into more detail. However, models um, need a lot of uh, data as well to work well. So the availability also of the data that can be used to train or to validate uh, a model uh, also is a very important consideration that uh, influences the selection of the tools uh, in a case study. So all those parameters have been um, uh, taken into consideration in order to reach to the uh, specific, let's say, composition specific, let's say, um, selection of, of the tools that have been used in prime water. 
Thank you, Apostolus. Um, we we received a few questions, some other questions from the audience, but as um, Samuela mentioned at the beginning, we will compile a Q&A report for the questions that we were not able to answer during this discussion. And now we will move on to the group my activity, which I have heard, which I've heard that is going really well. So we will continue the discussion there. I'll let Samuela share her screen. Yeah, thank you, Erin. I'll just uh, keep sharing the screen and uh, just a reminder to all the attendees to add your input into the uh, group map. Yeah. So uh, one of the questions from the group map, um, how are these data accessible? Are they open? At, well, yes, you've mentioned that they're open access. Um, but is there any cost related to the operational platform? And this is for the MBIS team. The use, the use of the operational platform. Apostolus? Oh, okay. Hello, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Right, but you cannot see us, suppose. No, I can't. Yep, something's... Um, That's okay, I can hear you. Ah, yes, I can see so, you. You mentioned about the costs. Yeah. Are there any costs yeah. related to the Prime World uh, platform? Yep. Uh, well, yeah, the operational services right now um, have a commercial uh, branch, uh, can are used uh, in uh, some cases. Uh, uh, for um, targeting uh, operational uh, everyday um, uh, requirements. So in that case, uh, there are costs associated mostly with um, the development of credible modeling uh, chains. So models do not work uh, on their own. Um, so let's say one cost center is related to um, calibrate, to validate, to train models, depending on, 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 uh, on uh, the tools that um, are used. And of course, there are also costs associated with um, the um, uh, Earth observation data uh, for water quality. Uh, also, also um, as has been described, uh, the source of this information comes from uh, the Copernicus uh, program, but also the uh, NASA services, Sentinel and Landsat uh, satellites. Uh, the primary, the raw data that are um, free of charge need further post-processing with um, uh, specific algorithms in order to be translated to um, the necessary information, whether this is chlorophyll, turbidity, temperature, or whatever else parameter uh, can be extracted from this information. So there are server, several, some, some cost centers that are associated with those um, aspects I've just mentioned. When it comes, uh, when, when uh, prime water services comes as a service um, to um, an end user. Okay, so then my question, and this, this is a question also to the panelists, um, the costs that, uh, of the services that Apostolus just broke down for us, gave us a bit of detail how the Prime Water Platform has been developed, um, including the cost of other things. Do you see this as a barrier? Or is this, a, or do you think that this is a misconception for uh, implementing or, or using EO tools and services, would you consider these costs as a barrier for the uptake of the services? Any, any, anyone can answer, but um, yeah, I would like to hear from any panelists on this. It, just say if it's for research, yes, you know, like, uh, <laughs> but I, I don't think uh, research uh, or uh, uh, academia is one of the targeted end users in this, uh, in this uh, uh, project. That's understandable. Uh, Jordi? Uh, I think it depends on the application. Uh, because, for example, uh, if you want to monitor a dam, 
uh, reservoir and you have to make analyzing a lot of points, this is not cheap. Uh, if thanks to a system, you can uh, a health observation system, you can take one sample uh, to validate the health observation with local data, and then you can use your system to extrapolate or to uh, model the evolution of the contamination, this is cheaper. Mm. Of course, it depends on the application. Uh, probably one of the main limitations of health observation techniques is uh, real time. Uh, they have, uh, which has commented that they have uh, two images per week. In some applications, this is not enough. Mm -hmm. In some applications, this is much enough. So according to the application, uh, I think uh, cost is not a problem. Okay, thank you, Jordi. Uh, and this? Right. Um, always there is a, a cost um, concern uh, around um, innovation, innovative or new applications. And I, I fully agree with uh, Jordi. This is uh, really um, uh, associated with the, um, um, the particular application and uh, the needs around that. So, um, there are cases where uh, water quality uh, issues are becoming very, very uh, critical in, uh, in uh, water supply systems uh, or in other um, water related industries. And therefore, um, being proactive, being, um, being in a position to act before um, early enough um before um these 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 biological uh, um let's say outbreaks um evolve fully evolve trying to mitigate in this way um the impact out of these events really makes uh, not only environmental um good sense but also uh very very good sense in terms of of the economics um around that we had the chance to uh, work uh, quite quite in detail um, on those aspects together with our end users, trying to understand how um, whether, of course, first in, in the first level, and how they could actually um, see any value out of of those services in their everyday uh, in their everyday uh, let's say operations. Um, a lot of this information will be published and will be available also in our project reports. But just a very quick, um, uh, sharing a very quick, let's say, overview. Uh, I'll bring an example for uh, the recreational industry, um, where, um, let's say, uh, bathing, bathing area, uh, swimming areas um, are really, um, and the, their commercial use uh, from people, for, for, for visitors, are really impeded by, by water quality um, issues. Here, there, in those cases, um, there are really important issues about related to public health uh, since algae blooms and har uh, harmful algae blooms they produce. Toxins, toxins can be um, infect uh, visitors, swimmers, uh, recreation people. Uh, and those costs are really associated with health costs. So running a very, very thorough um, economic analysis there, somebody can see significant benefits for being, for acting uh, early enough, warning people early enough, uh, banning the use of water early enough. So um, beyond, uh, let's say, conserving the environment, beyond protecting public health, also uh, ensuring um, cost efficiency um, uh, in, in this particular, let's say, um, uh, industry or, uh, let's say, activity. Well, similar approaches and similar, let's say, um, cost-efficient um, opportunity windows exist uh, in many other water-related and water-dependent industries uh, or water activities um, beyond, uh, let's say, the obvious uh, Environmental or public health um, benefits that can 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 be um, can be uh, observed or can be seen 
in these systems. But again, it's, it's very true, depends on the particular case and the severity of the problem that um, uh, an area faces uh, when it comes to water quality. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, again, to the panelists, I here in the risks section, I see cybersecurity as uh, listed and with the growing digital transformation of the water sector, uh, how do you see EO playing a role in this? Maybe how do you see this as a risk or maybe how it can help to change the minds of water professionals who might be hesitant to adopt these technologies because of this? Sure, Jordi, you can go ahead. Uh, cybersecurity is, um, I would say, an issue or a problem in all digital systems, not only in health observation system. My feeling is that in in this particular case, is not an additional risk. Uh, from from my experience, probably there's more problem in local sensor or or local measuring systems than not in in digital platform providing the image and, and the service. Uh, it's, it's a risk, of course, but uh, I would say it's not different from all the cybersecurity issues in all digital systems. Understood. Understood. Uh, I want to point out, oh, oh, Envis. Just a very quick remark on there. Um, there, I mean, water is a critical infrastructure, so it is it is go it goes hand by hand with um, with um, uh, certain specifications on on cybersecurity or other or digital uh, uh, on digital systems. I agree. It's not um, uh, well. Mostly uh, systems, uh, integrated systems like this one that we are presented, they need to comply with uh, general um, cybersecurity um, uh, requirements that of course, again, are there um, user specific. So each organization has its own uh, framework, uh, its own um, requirements for uh, in, in respect to that. So that becomes, um, um, a strong requirement um, as it is considered as a digital uh, system. So most of those um, integrated systems has to has to comply with internal uh, internal requirements uh, in this domain um, to be accepted by by a user. Thank you, Apostolis. So Fabian, I have a question here. In the risks section, I see someone has mentioned that low-income countries, especially with vast land areas, hoping to rely on EO rather than local data collection. And um, in your opinion, how do you think or how do you see it uh, for low- and middle-income countries, the prospect of using EO to also help with water management and resource management on a whole? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, from my experience in, in Ecuador, implementing earth observation uh, tools uh, for water leak detection, uh, we have to be very, uh, smart in describing the current cost of the traditional methodology and the benefits and opportunities using uh, new technologies such as earth observation. As you can see, uh, efficiency and productivity increases. So the return on investment of using new technologies supersedes the, the traditional methodology. So um, on, from this perspective, um, costs from low-income countries uh, cannot be a, 
uh, an absolute barrier to, to the development of these uh, type of projects. Thank you, Fabian. And um, I also want to ask uh, the panelists from India, so Dr. Rohini and uh, Dr. Rao, you could give your opinion on the use of EO in uh, low and middle income countries. Regarding the low income countries, I can say that it, it totally depends on the what sort of objective we have for a particular, uh, what is your base objective for uh, using any application. So uh, uh, there are many of the uh, uh, free softwares also, GIS or remote sensing softwares also that can be helpful. But at the same time, I can I will again repeat that it totally depends on the what sort of objective you have because it your objective decides the type of model you have to develop and the type of data you have to uh, use in this. So I totally uh, uh, straight uh, restraint uh, means focus on the use of the free software, freely available software that are that we can explore more and more because day by day there are more of the apps are being developed because uh, considering the large number of researchers along with the low income uh, uh, countries so uh, free softwares are available so i can say that that uh, much of our uh, demands can be uh, fulfilled using these softwares so i will complete my answer with this thank you thank you both uh both Rohini and Fabian on, on your inputs. And um, I think just just uh, adding to what Rohini mentioned here in the barriers, someone had mentioned uh, advert advertisement of the service. And um, I think that also ties into capacity building because not everybody knows what is available out there that can be used and um, not everybody fully understands and somebody also mentioned that there are not many people in the water sector who are interested in having to learn how to let's say run a platform or run um, a model they just want the, the, the answers so how then do we translate what has been developed in this prime water model how do we get it how do you get uh platforms like this uh similar to the platform to the operational platform how do we get it to, to, to the members who to the users who could benefit from it how do you suggest we break this one particular barrier of uh getting that information out there, promoting this information um, and po possibly just increasing capacity of end users for this. Apostolos? I, th I think that the answer here, um, uh, in my perspective, is uh, continuous development, continuous capacity building, um, because that really will um, train will um, um, will train users uh, towards against uh, new technologies new approaches there are a lot of um, uh, very uh, good tools available they are very good there is a lot of information nowadays available so um, continuous development and continuous capacity building um, I believe it's a key component in, let's say, um, um, reaching out to the point uh, of, um, or, or, or uh, moving towards more integrated, more complex, more um, uh, elaborated uh, systems. So I think, um, and at least this is the way that we have seen that uh, uh, a lot of our, um, uh, clients, a lot of, of the people that we work together, uh, not only um, commercial, but also in research, uh, a lot of end users, uh, this is how they're taking this digital journey. Um, they take it step by step. Uh, they try to, um, um, to gain uh, one, one step at a time, trying to define very well and very clearly their objectives their needs um, and this is um, our understanding about and our experience from all the discussions that we're having with possible users 
um, the way that they're they're trying to reach um, these goals, these digitalization, let's say, um, evolution in within the organizations. So a lot of different steps need to be taken. Um, each one uh, has its own challenges, um, but it becomes a very, very large challenge when somebody go and tries to, uh, let's say, um, make uh, significant jumps towards to more complex, more integrated, more um, demanding systems, uh, both technological, but also uh, in terms of costs. Thanks, Apostolos. Uh, this this discussion about capacity building and um, access to platforms like this also uh, brings me to the point here where somebody has mentioned that policymakers require highly confident EO products. And uh, we held a session, uh, we held a webinar last year about um, trans, trans, transforming science to policy. And um, it was mentioned that sometimes the policymakers are not fully aware of what is being done with the 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 results, what how, how these results are are formed, um, are created, generated, and how they can actually use this, and you know exactly what would help them implement this, be more uh, encouraged to implement this. So. Um, from the panelists, do you have uh, any thoughts on how we can encourage policymakers to implement these, the use of these tools and services? Because as we can see, they're beneficial. They give an all round view of water resources. So how can we convince them that this can also be used to address the global water challenges. Uh, Jordi and then Vagelis. You're muted, Jordi. Sorry. Sorry, my fault. Yeah, yeah. Just a quick answer to the previous question. I think mm -hmm. that one important thing we have to have clear about the tools is that uh, for being a user of a tool, you don't need to know how it's been done. That means probably uh, most of the attendants are specialists in water quality, but probably none of us uh, want to know how this tool is made inside. We just want to be users. Oh. And uh, I think we don't need to, uh, to make training about artificial intelligence to use the tool. Eh? I think there are two different uh, elements. One is the pe person who makes the tool, that they have to be expertise in in artificial intelligence, they have observation, and the other one is the user that we were, we just want to get the results and know that the tool is working and helps in our work that it's water management. And, and then answering the, the, the current questions, I think for uh, the important thing, I think is not policies, is uh, users of the tools. I think uh, the, the only question is if this tool is helpful for users of water quality control to make them uh, they work easier, if, if it's really a, a decision support tool that helps us to work in this field, if it helps us to uh, make the forecast of uh, algae blooms in, in a reservoir on a lake, etc. Because at the end, policies probably they they're only use will be if they make some grants to use the tool or things like that. But at the end, uh, they will just ask the end users, are you using the tool, uh, if it's useful for you or not. Okay. And uh, Vagelis, I, I actually want to come back to you, Jordi, on that. But uh, Vagelis, I will give you the floor. <laughs> Yeah, and just a quick uh, remark on that. I, would I want to bring the, an example here with our policy maker, uh, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency um, uh, in Scotland, that they are now using an earth observation uh, based uh, a service for monitoring uh, uh, lakes and locks in, uh, in, in Scotland. And uh, how th this happened was like a long uh, journey. We co developed. Uh, uh, with them, the, the, the products, they were really involved in the production and the development of the, of the products. We had uh, 
uh, people from uh, uh, CIPA, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, joining us here at the university and uh, spending a lot of time uh, here uh, with us learning about the tools and also involved, as I said, in the uh, development of the of the products, but also building this uh, confidence to the, the tools, uh, uh, compare, uh, allow the allow comparisons with uh, the traditional methods, no? like uh, uh, compare the products, the satellite products with the ground uh, um, uh, uh, data and showing that uh, the, the satellite products are, uh, are of high confidence, but also uh, showing that the, the what uh, additional value can add, no? that uh, uh, you cannot, uh, you can uh, go, you, ha you can have information about the entire uh, system, no? not only one point that you typically uh, sample once every every uh, year. So this is just uh, just a comment to to as an example of the journey we had here with the Scottish Environment Protection Agency that ended up uh, with them using uh, uh, satellite-based uh, 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 products. Thank you, Vagelis. Uh, Jordi, I think Vagelis actually uh, gave an example of what I wanted to come back to you on um, because er not every end user is a private um, end user. So sometimes when government agencies want to, when, when well, I guess from a scientific perspective, when scientists are trying to get government agencies to adopt their technologies to just show them that okay this can actually help you manage your resources better um getting legislators and the policymakers involved helps for this so so i completely understand your standpoint in that maybe from a private sector perspective policy is not that important but um in terms of government run resources sometimes it's very important to get policymakers on board if if i could just mention that here uh dr rohini your hand is up actually Irina, i totally agree with the points you have made actually because being uh, in the government sector i totally agree that uh, yeah okay the tools are helpful for us but parallelly we have to be dependent on the other parameters also and also, we can't publicize what sort of parameter we are using to the uh, public domain. So it's like a combination of uh, uh, different uh, things, I can say. It's not a totally uh, or earth observation thing or uh, the other uh, parameters we use. It's a total combination of the work that we present in the public domain. But there are some hidden things that we don't expose to the public domain. So I would like to complete my answer. Thank you. Yes, that also plays a role. And maybe let's take it to a, a positive light. And uh, we see, I actually see quite a few benefits here. Um, how do you see the future of, uh, maybe I will point this to Envis and then the, the panelists can also uh, jump in here because how technology is going is constantly evolving it's constantly changing and um apostolus and evangelus uh, we actually received a question about um how prime water will develop the platform will develop in the future so do you intend to include more parameters so like heavy metals especially for countries who have water quality issues um well from for the effects of mining and uh, different operations how do you plan to evolve uh yeah help the, the program to evolve to assess these as well right um yeah, I mean, Prime Water uh, had a very clear mandate uh, around um, um, uh, phytoplankton uh, um, uh, water quality uh, aspects. Um, obviously, this is not um, the only water quality concern around the globe, and certainly uh, might not be um, the more the most, let's say, uh, important in many other cases. As you mentioned, there are very, very strong concerns about um, specific chemicals, about specific um, um, heavy metals uh, or other substances. However, 
um, the starting point of prime water was also how to utilize earth observations and uh, earth observations they do come together with certain limitations and the certain limitations when it comes to uh, monitoring uh, uh, the surface uh, water quality in, 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 in water and this limitation uh, goes together uh, is, is associated with the optical signature uh, of uh, those particular um, uh, pollutants that they can leave so uh, this is a, a very, this is a, an intrinsic limitation of this technology. Uh, it needs to read uh, a signature and translate the signature into an actual measurement. So when it comes, when certain, uh, when certain, let's say, contaminants do not leave uh, this uh, type of, of, of uh, uh, signatures, uh, it's very hard to use uh, remote sensing uh, to actually measure those. Um, modeling, of course, they do have, uh, it has a lot of uh, uh, opportunities there and modeling is used in, in actually in, in uh, uh, understanding uh, the dynamics uh, of those, uh, in many cases, of those particular and very specific chemicals. So there are opportunities there and of course Prime Water has, um, as a project, has concluded its, its uh, lifetime but has generated uh, a lot of, um, let's say, good ideas. There are a lot of scientific challenges um, that uh, certainly can be the basis for um, transforming and expanding those concepts to many other domains. So the answer, in, in few words, is yes, there are a lot of uh, opportunities uh, scientifically to explore um, when it comes to um, cross-cutting uh, scientific um, applications. Thank you, Apostolos. Uh, as we are coming to kind of the close of this, this um, discussion, I want to pose this well, this question to uh, MVIS, and then I would ask all the panelists to give their uh, just final remarks about the, the whole session. But um, how do you see, and this was a question from the Q&A, but I think it, it, it helps to wrap up the discussion also, and it brings like, it, it kind of is based on the rationale of what we're trying to do here today as well. Um, the core design process, and this was from Mary Mary Beth in the Q and A, and she asked, "Do you have a comment on the value of the core design process with the stakeholder?" And this is especially from the user perspective of the process. So, how do you see the value of getting end user feedback while you continue to improve the system? What does that mean for you? I think I think it's uh, the most important part of uh, the of of um, let's say uh, developing um, an application that makes sense. So if this part is missing, um, a lot of effort, a lot of um, um, work uh, can be um, certainly scientifically valid and viable. However, when it comes to addressing um, actual uh, needs uh, on the ground, these, let's say, distance, this gap needs to be filled in. And there, the perspective of people that they do operate, they do work, they do intend uh, to, to use those kind of, of, of uh, systems, they need such uh, tools uh, because their existing practices um, uh, cannot uh, or cannot um, uh, support any more decision making, or they need further information to, to support information making uh, decision making. Those uh, uh, those people and their perspectives are are becoming important and very critical in developing um, an actual system that can be used for uh, specific purposes. So. Uh, it has been in prime water, uh, it has been the primary uh, goal to include um, uh, our, let's say, partners in the project from the very first day. 
uh, in this co-development journey with a lot of iterations, with a lot of uh, discussions that actually influenced also the scientific components of the project because science was also tried to address uh, specific challenges, some of them very, very, um, uh, very ambitious. So it was a very strong incentive, not only for uh, how to actually um, present a commercial, to develop a commercial service, but also how to streamline uh, scientific effort, trying to address, um, in some cases, very, uh, as I said, ambitious um, requirements in, in certain cases. So it is, it is a very important process um, when it comes to um, completing um, the development of such, um, uh, such um, uh, scientific workflows. Thank you, Apostolos. Uh, can I ask the attendees as we are closing, well, as quickly as you can, <laughs> uh, just to share your final remarks about today's session. Maybe Vagelis, I could get your final remarks. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you. And uh, thanks again to the uh, to Apostolis and Vagelis for the, for the presentation and everyone here in the panel for the very interesting discussion. Um, I I think it's crystal clear the the benefits to decision making that these tools can these methodologies can can have and on the other hand it generates a lot of questions and uh, I see challenges as well uh, when uh, you uh, develop uh, products that they are specific to to the needs uh, of the, of the sector no? and how uh, you can tailor uh, this and the costs involved after for tailoring uh, these tools for the needs of uh, of a different uh, sector of, or a, a different uh, uh, a user. Uh, from experience, uh, it's great to see that uh, the, the products uh, have gone uh, outside uh, uh, Europe and uh, like with examples from the US and, uh, and Australia and uh, have examples as well that uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, countries they want the products to be developed by by local companies nor by someone that they they feel uh, closer to to them maybe not so much in the private sector but in the public sector I've seen examples in south america for example that they they want the, to have the capacity rather than being handed the the products uh, uh, over no so uh, this is uh, something uh, uh, of uh, of uh, of interest and specifically like uh, uh, when uh, I imagine when uh, you develop uh, a products with uh, a, a view to um, to sell them uh, 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 commercially. And as a last point, I think capacity building is mentioned uh, a lot. It's very very uh, important. There are uh, initiatives. I uh, have people here, Mary Beth as well from AquaWatch, but WWQA and uh, other uh, global uh, institutions or institutions and uh, organizations with global reach try to uh, to build uh, capacity, uh, especially for uh, lower uh, income uh, countries. And capacity sometimes means that. Uh, 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 that you you get this trust as well by the by the users but i will i will stop here because i can go for hours but uh, thanks uh, thanks again and uh, well done for a great uh, for a great job to to prime prime water thank you uh, any other panelists would okay, like to give any closing remarks from their side yes jordi okay just uh... Adding to what Bagalisa say, I think that uh, there's a high evolution or revolution uh, in the last years, thanks to adding uh, artificial intelligence to health observation. It's clear that health observation 
does not solve all the problems. Uh, but join it with other techniques like uh, local monitoring, uh, weather forecast, etc., will help uh, water quality control uh, to improve the coverage. Uh, and uh, somebody has said that in, in low income countries uh, could help, not could help, helps, but uh, you cannot believe that. Uh, Without local data, you will get all the information, but with some local data, you can get a lot of information. And it's clear that uh, in the following years, uh, more applications oriented to the end user will appear. Fabian, thank you, Jordi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to add uh, a few comments. First, um, these uh, earth of observation tools can be also useful for insurance uh, industry. I mean, you can reduce and mitigate uh, risks uh, with an effective uh, tool for reducing the economic impact of, of preventing risk. So, it can be useful to 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 add into the field of water related events other industries that are not usually related to 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 water management um also the in the in the short time and then in the midterm um there is a big opportunity for uh, satellite industry. I mean, uh, this expansion of the activity of satellite industry will reduce the price and cost for accessing satellite data. So it will help low-income countries to, to get access to to, to high reliable information from, from Earth observation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Fabian. Uh, I will hand over to my colleague, Samuela, just to close everything. Thank you so much, Erin, and thank you to all the attendees and panelists for uh, joining the session uh, today. I'll uh, um, just share my screen for one more quick minute. So um, if you are still in um, the group map, uh, please do uh, complete our feedback um, survey. I've moved you all to this uh, um, screen so you will be able to see some, some questions and uh, please do take some time uh, to uh, complete this. The group map will stay on until uh, um, uh, uh, after, even after the, the session. So do uh, take some time to fill um, that. Um, so uh, just some uh, upcoming uh, um, IWA webinars and events, we have a webinar on safely managed sanitation on 6 June, so if you are interested in the topic, please do uh, register for that. And uh, of course, you can learn more about the upcoming Water and Development Congress and exhibition in uh, um, Kigali, Rwanda in uh, December. Uh, if you are still not an IWA uh, member, uh, we uh, can share with you uh, um, a discount uh, code that you'll see here in the um, screen, but also I think my colleague put it in the chat. So this is valid until the end of the year. So do take this opportunity to uh, join the um, uh, other water uh, professionals in our network. And uh, with this, Erin, I think uh, we can close the, the session. Once again, thank you so much for joining and contributing to the discussion. I think it was a very interesting and helpful discussion uh, that uh, nicely wraps up the uh, Prime Water uh, webinars. So uh, thank you all again, and uh, you will receive uh, um, communication from us about the recording, uh, the Q&A, and we, where we will reply to questions that they were not answered during the session. And 
the, um, the, the presentation of this um, session. So um, thank you and have a nice uh, rest of the day. Thank you, everyone.